My name is Anna Trendafilido. I hold the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Migration and Integration at Toronto Metropolitan University. And I'm very happy to welcome you all here in such a distinguished panel. Um, I want to start by doing the land acknowledgement. We're meeting today in Toronto, which is the Dish with One Spoon territory, the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississauga tribes. And the Dish with One Spoon is an invitation for all of us to share the natural resources of this land, come, uh, come together in peace, and have a sense of our responsibility for the generations that came before us and those that are yet to come. And I think this is a very important message not only in relation to migration, which is our field of study, but also in relation to climate change and all the multiple, unfortunately, crises that the world is facing today and Canada within it. We hope that at TMU, we're making just a little, we're putting a little brick in the wall of decolonization with changing our name, but also with the research activities that we do every day. And I personally feel my responsibility as an uninvited guest to this land. I came to Canada in 2019. And for someone who works on mobility, on global mobility, it's difficult to come to terms with the claim of the land, but I think this is part of our moral and scientific responsibility. Without further ado, I want to first of all thank Rupa Banerjee, a CRC in TMU and a, a friend of uh, our program and part of our steering committee for bringing this wonderful event to us uh, with such a big question. Uh, so for anyone who doesn't know, we're going to discuss today whether the Canadian dream is broken or how it can be mended, I suppose. Um, I'd like to give the floor now to my colleague, research area lead on labor migration, Dr. Masha Akbar, who is going to introduce the speakers and the event. And I look forward to hearing from everyone. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I'm Marcia Akbar, and I'm very pleased and delighted to introduce today's speakers and the panelists. So the title of today's event is, Is the Canadian Dream Broken? with a big question mark. Recent trend in equality of opportunity for the racialized second generation. So we have three speakers today. Uh, the first speaker is Rupa Banerjee. Canada Research Chair and Associate Professor of Human Resource Management and Organizational Behavior at Toronto Metropolitan University. Then we have Jeffrey Rich, Professor Emeritus of Sociology and Professor Emeritus of Ethnic Immigration and Pluralism Studies at University of Toronto. Uh, Jeffrey is joining us on Zoom, um, so he's there. Uh, and then we have Wendell Ajeti, Assistant Professor and William Dawson Chair, History and Classical Studies at McGill University. Then we have four panelists today, including Debbie Douglas, Executive Director at Ontario Council of Agencies Serving Immigrants. We have Gervan Ferron, President of George Brown College. Then we have Nicholas King, immigration reporter with Toronto Star. He is also joining us on Zoom. And finally, we have Nahid Nenshi, former mayor of Calgary. So today's event is organized into three segments. In the first segment, the three researchers and authors and our speakers, Rupa Banerjee, Jeffrey Rich, and Wendell Ajiti will discuss the research study. Rupa will present the research and uh, Jeffrey and Wendell will also share their comments on the research and research findings. And this segment will take approximately 30 minutes. Uh, then the second segment will feature a discussion with our panelists. Rupa Banerjee will ask four questions to our panelists to get their insights and views on the research findings and policy implications. This segment will take about one hour. And then the final and the third segment, um, we will open the floor for the audience to ask questions. So we'll take questions from both in-person and online audience. And we have Stein Montero here, a senior research associate with the SARC Migration Program. He will gather the questions from the online audience. So it will be a wonderful, exciting, informative event. Without further ado, uh, let's hear from Rupa Banerjee.
Thanks so much, Marsha. Thanks uh, to Anna and the whole CERC team for helping to put this together. It was a lot of work. Um, doing these hybrid events are always an extra bit of work, so I really appreciate that. So um, today, if I can ask you to close that so I can see the slides. There we go. Okay, so, um, you know, as Marsha mentioned, and Anna mentioned as well, the question that we are tackling is um, really about the outcomes of the second generation. When I say the second generation, I'm talking about the children of immigrants, um, once they are no longer children, but in fact, young adults. So um, in this particular study, uh, we analyzed a number of data sets to come up with some recent trends in equality of opportunity for the racialized second generation in Canada. This research is co-authored by uh, Jeff Wright, um, Feng Hu, who's associated with the Department of Sociology at Western, and Wendell, of course. So uh, I'm kind of gonna present a little bit of the overview of the actual research results, and then we'll move on to the discussion. Okay, so why are we interested in the second generation? Well, the second generation, first of all, is a massively growing demographic in Canada, as we've had increases in immigration and increased diversity of our immigrant um, cohorts arriving in Canada, we, we find that the second generation is not only growing, but is growing increasingly diverse. So one in four people actually identifies uh, as non-white, as a racialized minority, and the proportion of racialized minorities that are actually second generation is also growing significantly. So we actually expect the, the racialized second generation to double between 2016 and 2041. So this is a really large group and it's a group of uh, significant interest. So in many ways, when we think about migrant integration, there are a number of major issues that we see immigrants face. And a lot of them have to do with uh, foreign credentials, foreign experience, lack of language skills. These are the the issues uh, that we often discuss as being barriers to uh, immigrants when they come to, to Canada. The second generation should face none of those issues. So they, they are brought up in the destination country, they've had their, sc their schooling here, um, they're fluent in the language, they have access to local social networks and job search strategies, they know how to get by in Canada. And so you would think that they should have pretty much equal opportunities as everybody else. Um, and so any disadvantage we see, uh, you might expect that it, it might be due to discrimination more likely than in the immigrant generation. Um, so a lot of the previous studies that have looked at the second generation tend to focus on older cohorts. So those whose parents arrived sort of in the post 60s um, immigrant cohorts. So those arriving in the 70s. And that uh, body of research has found that in general, in Canada, we see a really optimistic model of integration for the second generation. So high levels of education, um, economic success, and although there is some evidence of um, discrimination or disadvantage, there, you know, in general, it's a very um, positive story. We do note, though, a lot of studies have found some origin differences uh, among the second generation. So this is really what we were interested in exploring. I mean, initially, my interest was mo more generally in the second generation as a whole. But once we started digging in the data, what we noticed is that there are some significant origin differences. And that's where our research kind of led us. So as I mentioned, most of the work to date has focused on earlier arrival cohorts. And, um, you know, it, it's really high time to update that research and bring it into more, uh, more recent cohorts. We see that immigrant characteristics have been evolving um, over the cohorts. So research has widely found that immigrants arriving since the 1970s and 80s have experienced uh, worse economic outcomes despite being more highly educated. So they tend to face uh, greater barriers in the labor market, more difficulty with credential recognition. So, uh, you know, all the up until about 2015, certainly, we've found increasingly deteriorating immigrant labor market outcomes. So we were really interested if the parents are facing these deteriorating labor market outcomes across cohorts, does that affect the children? And if so, how? That was our original question. 
So um, uh, doing a cohort analysis, actually looking at different cohorts, those arriving in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, would allow us to actually um, examine whether the evolving characteristics affects the children. So our research questions were, how do the educational and earnings outcomes of the second generation young adults from five of the largest racialized groups in Canada compared to uh, those in third or higher generation white Canadians across three uh, birth year cohorts from the mid sixties to the mid nineties. And initially we were really interested in whether the changing characteristics of the immigrant parents would explain trends in the children's educational and earnings outcomes. So actually capturing that proved to be extremely difficult. So of course we don't have matching data with immigrants and their children over time. That would be wonderful if we had that, of course we don't have that. So um, how we got around that was by using census data from 1981, 91, 2001, uh, 2021 and the NHS from nine, uh, 2011. Um, we matched potential immigrants with their potential children. So what I mean is uh, we looked ethnic group by ethnic group, so say South Asian uh, uh, immigrant children to their uh, parent cohort who would have been the right age group 20 years earlier to have potentially been their parents. And that's how we match children to parents in a pseudo kind of a way. We focused on five racialized groups uh, aged, the second generation uh, aged 26 to 35. And those groups are South Asians, Chinese, Black, Filipino, and Latin American. I should put in a caveat here, the, La the Filipino group, and to some extent, the Latin American group, the numbers weren't quite large enough to really draw very conclusive um, uh, conclusions there, but uh, we, these are the groups that we kind of focused on. And as I mentioned, we looked at three birth cohorts, 66 to 75, 76 to 85, 86 to 95. So those who were born in 66 to 75, their parents came in the 60s, right? Uh, those who were born in 76 to 85, you can imagine, um, came in the 70s, etc. The reference group for us was what we often think of as mainstream Canadians. So third and higher generation white Canadians, and we controlled for age as well. So this diagram kind of like spells out the way we matched parents to children. So we looked at um, uh, the parents data from 1981 and the children's matched data from 2001. So although they weren't actually the direct parents of those particular immigrants, uh, it kind of represents the characteristics, the average characteristics of the parents that they may have had. So uh, 81, uh, the parents' uh, data was from 81, children's from 2001, et cetera. So turning right to the findings, when we look at said the second generation overall, without really delving into the um, ethnic groups separately or the racialized groups separately, uh, we find that um, educational attainment has gone up significantly over the cohorts. So uh, in general, the second generation tends to be very highly educated, uh, much more so than the mainstream, and that has been just increasing over the cohorts. And that's particularly true of women. Uh, that being said, there were some serious differences between educational attainment within the groups. So we found that um, among Chinese and South Asian second generation uh, young people, the education levels tended to increase over the cohorts, whereas Black and Latin American individuals la lagged, and in fact, their dis uh, disparities widened um, over the cohorts. And, and finally, when we tried to see if um, the children's educational outcomes were related to their parents, we find that there is some relationship there. It's not significant, uh, it's, not, it's not massive, but there is some uh, relationship between the children's educational growth and the parents' higher educational attainment. So we know that the immigrants' parents' higher education has been going up significantly over the cohorts. And so that is kind of a testament to why their children might be increasingly educated as well. So here's some models. I mean, it kind of shows, it's hard to see the legend there at the top, 
but um, the dark blue bar there is the, the Chinese group. You can see that they surge and the, the green is the South Asians. Um, and then the, oh, I can't see the, the legend up there. Um, but in general, we find that when you have no controls, you're not taking any account of any other factors, the, the Chinese and South Asian groups education surges significantly, whereas uh, the others tend to actually um, be going down over the cohorts. This is for women. And for women, you'll note that uh, in general, yeah, the educational levels are you know, significantly more, even for the, the Black and Latin American group, before you take controls of other things like um, father's education and income level. So when we look at earnings, we find once again, when you simply look at the second generation as a whole, earnings levels dropped. So this is a bit of a paradoxical finding. Education levels surged, but earnings levels dropped. So um, uh, all of that being said, there's some real significant differences between the groups. So uh, for the Chinese and South Asian groups, the earnings levels were relatively stable. They didn't drop too much. Whereas for the Black and Latin American population, they dropped significantly. So for example, in the first birth cohort, Black men had an earnings deficit of 15.2% relative to the mainstream. By the third cohort, it was 33%. And for women, in the very first cohort, Black women actually had an uh, earnings advantage of 17%. 17 By the end, last cohort, it had dropped to 10% deficit. So you can see that um, the earnings have dropped for almost all groups, but mostly for the Black and Latin American populations. And most significantly, based on our model, we find that the second generation earnings, earnings decline is relatively independent of their parents' experiences. So even when you take account of how their parents are doing in the labor market, uh, it doesn't really change their earnings levels, if that makes sense. So similarly, uh, you know, the, these are some, some uh, graphs to kind of show just the level of drop. You can see that the, the line is going down and getting larger as you move uh, across the different cohorts. And this is for women. The story is relatively the same. But an interesting um, side finding is that for Chinese women, the second generation is doing remarkably well, even when you take control of all, all these other factors. Um, so uh, that's a group that seems to be, you know, very highly successful in the labor market. So what do we find? We find that education levels are increasing. However, despite these higher education levels, second generation cohorts successive, successively across cohorts saw lower annual earnings relative to the mainstream Canadian population. These trends kind of applied across genders and most ethnic groups. Uh, and they're not, especially in terms of earnings, they're not really explained by parental income. Um, what we really find most strikingly is that the earnings decline hits the hardest for second generation black men and women, and to some extent for Latin American population as well, compared to other groups. And this really needs further explanation. We've been exploring those further explanations. And of course, with the quantitative study that we did, it's hard for us to dig into the reasons and the explanations. So we're exploring things like uh, shifting occupational structures in the economy, demoralization from cumulative effects of discrimination, changes in community resources perhaps, or the growth of ethnic neighborhoods. So these are the, the issues that we thought of, but you know, we're interested in hearing from the panel to, to get their understanding of perhaps what's happening. So um, now I am going to turn it over to my co-author, Dr. Jeffrey Wrights, uh, to introduce a little bit of um, Wendell's uh, contribution. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, well, good morning, and uh, thank you all for attending. Um, and thanks, Rupa, for the for the presentation. So we're going to turn to the discussion now. As Rupa emphasized, we found what we found was not what we were expecting. We were expecting 
to find that the increasing struggle of immigrant parents through the successive cohorts were, were going to affect their kids and affect the prevailing generally fairly positive view of the second generation story, which was based only on the first cohort of uh, uh, immigrants uh, uh, born to immigrants from the late 60s and early 70s. Um, we found group differences there, but uh, less positive outcomes for Blacks. But the main story there was a kind of positive one. And to our surprise, what we found, as, as Rup has described, that there was some of that. But the main story that emerged was one of the growing divergences um, among the groups as the subsequent cohorts emerged and reached adulthood. There were lower relative earnings for all groups compared to uh, earlier cohorts, but the differences among groups substantially widened. Uh, to some extent, the positive story for Chinese and South Asians was continuing. The black young adults, both men and women, were much less successful in employment earnings compared to the first cohort to an extent that was striking and frankly, uh, uh, somewhat worrisome. Similar though less extreme trends were also found for Latin American and Filipino young adults. So now we wanna pursue uh, certain key questions <clears throat> about these findings and the potential policy implications. First of all, the numbers are striking, but what did they really mean for the lives of the more recent second generation cohort? How do the impacts play out in the affected communities? Do people feel the more negative environment? For those who are struggling, and 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 for those uh, uh, for the fewer who are enjoying uh, success, and second, what are the causes behind these trends? Now we doubted that they were very much that they were simply a reflection of shifting immigrant characteristics, such as more black people, for example, coming from African origins rather than the Caribbean. This would not have produced a decline, but in any case, the declines would have been observed for the immigrant parents uh, too, and we've taken that account, account of parental earnings in our analysis. We doubted that discriminatory treatment in labor markets was dramatically increasing, uh, though it seemed that the impact of such discrimination might be becoming more serious. We also wondered about the significance of ethnic community resources or about isolation in the most disadvantaged uh, communities. And we wanna hear more about that. Regarding policy, of course, we've seen some changes in the past practice of addressing visible or racialized minorities in a single category, ignoring the important differences and the problems that different groups face. We've seen increased awareness of the greater pressures on both black and indigenous communities in Canada and some policies are changing. Truth and reconciliation uh, efforts, for example, uh, in the case of indigenous people and for immigrant groups, we recognizing black people as uh, distinct in the federal employment equity legislation is an important uh, initiative and the supporting black Canadian communities initiative, which is a federal program providing funds in support of black communities administered in ways determined by the black community itself and which one of our panelists is involved is important, but what strategies are needed to address young adult uh, uh, employment uh, issues more specifically? And given public resistance to policies such as employment equity uh, at the provincial level, which were, would apply more broadly, what would be needed to garner public support for the necessary policies? So exploring these questions in a public way is the purpose of today's event. And before we turn to our very distinguished panel, I'd like to call upon our, uh, one of our co-authors uh, with special knowledge of the Black community. This is Dr. Wendell Nilaye Ajakti. Uh, uh, he's an assistant professor of history and cultural studies at McGill, where he holds the William Dawson chair. His Yale doctoral thesis is now a book from the University of North Carolina Press entitled Cross-Border Cosmopolitans, The Making of a Pan-African uh, North America. He didn't request that plug, but I'm putting it in. And uh, Wendell's perspective is also shaped by growing up in Toronto, where his extensive participation in our Black community, including in relation to youth and uh, mentorship, has been recognized. It's been my pleasure to know Wendell as a student in the U of T Harney uh, 
immigration and ethnicity uh, specialization some 15 years ago, and I'm delighted he's a co-author on this project. So, Wendell. Thank you so much, Jeff. Can everyone hear me okay? Good morning to you all. My name is Wendell Nilaye Ajite. I'm also known as Nilaye Osabu Kenklemo Atriko Wiblahin Kobaya Manche. First and foremost, I give thanks to the Creator, indeed to the God of my ancestors, and to the covenant of my ancestors, Osabu, Osabu Late, O Gidi Gidi, Beg Betig Betty, Katamansu Tache, Nunko Nunko, Bochukum, Bunyaga, Bubuami. I give thanks to the spirit of my ancestors. So this project, yeah, this project means so much to me, given the sensitivity and given the timeliness of this research discovery. But first and foremost, I must acknowledge that Governments choose winners and governments choose losers, especially in a stratified, racially stratified society. Put differently, governments determine the groups that will succeed and governments determine the groups that will fail. For the purposes of my very brief remarks today, I must also acknowledge that we must reckon with the uncomfortable truth that the Canadian federal government and various levels of government, in addition to the US government, especially in the post-World War II period, implemented policies clandestine, but nonetheless policies due to various national security threats that have created the dysfunction that we see in so many Black communities and neighborhoods, especially in post-industrial inner city settings. On my way here yesterday, I learned from family as well as um, various news sources that there was a, a shooting in North Toronto where I worked, where I have little beautiful black girls and boy nephews, nieces, godchildren, um, dear family members in Driftwood Courts in particular in North Toronto. There was a shooting there, a 16 year old, not gang affiliated, not involved in any criminality is in critical uh, condition. There is a, a man in his forties, an immigrant from Ghana, a black man, a father of four who is now deceased not gang involved, not criminally involved, both individuals waiting for the TTC to go to work and extracurricular activities. By virtue of being black, by virtue of being male, they are dead or lying on a hospital bed in critical condition. And this has become by and large the narrative that we see propagated where black men are concerned. Now, why is that? How do we get here? Are black people just inclined to engage in criminality and gang banging? Or is there more to the story? And as a historian, this is the vantage point that I brought to this research project and to aid my very esteemed colleagues. In the 1960s, with the liberalization of immigration policy, especially in Canada, but certainly in the 1960s, as there was an increased influx of immigrants from the Caribbean basin, African peoples from the Caribbean basin, and then subsequently Africans from the continent. With this increase of a much darker hued future nation builders, Canadian politicians, but especially Canada's national security apparatus in collaboration with the US federal government began to exploit certain dynamics, mainly to infiltrate, mainly to discredit, mainly to sabotage the growing militant organizing. Again, peaceful, nonviolent organizing 
in black communities in this country, in this very city, and black communities in the United States. Why? Because if the Canadian government could expose that this new wave of immigrants from Jamaica, Barbados, St. Lucia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in their civil and human rights activism were engaged in other forms of conduct unbecoming, well then, the national security apparatus could advise members of parliament, cabinet ministers to curtail immigration coming out of the Caribbean basin. And so what did Canada do with the aid of US national security apparatus? Remember, this is the era of civil rights, which would eventually become black power. And black power simply means self-determination for African peoples and the control over community resources for African peoples. But this idea that when black folk organize to expose the unbelievable levels of anti-Black racism in Canadian society, that that in and of itself constituted a threat to national security and the means or justification to undermine or counter subvert, to use their nomenclature, nomenclature, Black organizing. And so federal operatives who had worked for the FBI in terms of infiltrating Black organizing in the United States were brought to Canada, facilitated at a very high level, even behind the prime minister's back. Trudeau didn't, Pierre, we've had two Trudeaus now, so let me specify. Mm -hmm. Pierre Elliott Trudeau was unaware. His attorney general, who was then known as the solicitor general, was unaware, mostly. And so black federal operatives living right here in this city, paid on the federal role, okay, working for the RCMP, collaborating with the Toronto police, infiltrated various levels of our community, engaged in very predatorial conduct that is grooming little black boys who had a penchant or a desire to engage in the black politics, the militant black politics and black power of their parents' generation, that said individuals were marked for extermination or neutralization, that it was better to turn them into criminals and gangbangers than to have them shaming Canada and exposing the racism, the deep levels of anti-Black racism in this society. This is a scandal of which 99.99% of Canadians know not because we think for the most part, we live in a civil and democratic society. Some of you might, I don't, and many members of my community don't live in said community or said society. And so when we, we look at the data and the ways that it is very gendered, although of course, both black men, black women are experiencing very high levels of discrimination and lack of social mobility. When we look at these trends, it becomes very clear that we haven't done an adequate job, especially as policymakers, as intellectuals, academics, researchers, we haven't done an adequate job to understand the gender dynamics and why in particular that black males, that is boys and young men are floundering and why they engage in the high risk behavior of, of gang banging, gang violence, criminality, et cetera, et cetera. These are trends, these are manufactured, concocted schemes to destabilize black communities. This is not a fairy tale, it is not conspiratorial. We have hard empirical evidence through declassified intelligence documents from the US federal government and Canadian federal government. And part of the reason why we see this divergence, especially where the males are concerned in black communities is because under patriarchal systems and white supremacy certainly, but under patriarchal systems, yes, patriarchies exploit women's labor and reproductive rights. Yes, patriarchies try to control women's reproductive power, but that's actually secondary and sometimes even tertiary. 
the primary objective of patriarchy, and especially in a white supremacist society, is to render the boys and the men of the outgroup, meaning black boys and young men, to neutralize them, to prevent them from competing with white men, prevent them from perhaps procreating with white women. This is the ultimate objective. So how do you do that? How do you achieve that type of structure? Well, you can create the conditions for the community to devour itself and for the men to be slowly eliminated through death, early death, through mass incarceration, through various forms of social disorganization. And then it becomes a free flowing process. And so this is what we're dealing with in a city like Toronto, in a region like the metropolitan area. These are not dynamics that are just endemic and natural to how Black people behave. Hence why governments determine who succeeds and who fails, right, in our racialized and stratified society. There's so much more I can say, but in the interest of time, I will hold it there. Okay, well, thank you very much, Wendell, for that uh, statement, which is, I think, a valuable perspective on, on the work that we've done. And now we're going to uh, turn to our panel. It's a very uh, distinguished group, and uh, we're taking in alphabetical order. Debbie Douglas, as mentioned, the Executive Director of Alcassie, the Ontario Council of Agencies Serving Immigrants, is one of the best known and most respected advocates for the needs of immigrants and minority communities. Her work has been recognized in many awards, and she's recently appointed to the Order of Canada. Uh, Gervin Fierin is an economist, president of George Brown College, formerly a professor at TMU, I might add, and now chairing the external advising group for the uh, Supporting Black Canadian Communities Initiative. Nicholas Kung is the Toronto Star's immigration reporter, well known over many years for his knowledge of and passion for immigration issues, and he's certainly one of the most well-regarded journalists on his beat in Canada. And last but hardly least, I am pleased to welcome Naid Nenshi, elected three times as mayor of Calgary beginning in 2011, still undefeated, reported to be likely to contend for public office again soon. As a person of South Asian origins, and, <laughs> as a first as a person of South Asian origins and the first Muslim mayor of a major North American city, Naid Nenshi has considerable experience and understanding of the realities of racialized minorities in Canada, their opportunities and the barriers they face. Each panel member will have 10 to 15 minutes for uh, comments on our questions, and then we have time for exchanges among the panel members and open uh, question and answer. Uh, Rupa will be moderating, moderating this discussion. Thank you, uh, Rupa. Thanks so much, Jeff, and thank you to Wendell. Uh, so we're going to start with Debbie. Um, go ahead and you know, feel free to answer these questions or any other angle that you see is appropriate here. Um, sure. Thank. Thank you so much um, for having me. Um, this morning, um, my brother Wendell, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for um, calling in our ancestors. Thank you for your um, passionate lesson um, on the experiences of our peoples here in Canada. Um, I found the, the report, the research report fascinating. Um, and I came away thinking anti-Black racism is real anti-Black racism has material impact on people's lives, and anti-Black anti racism isn't new in Canada. And so while I wasn't surprised by the overall findings of the what I'm calling the hierarchy of inequality among the various racial groups, um, I was a bit taken aback by the significant, significant drop in Black men's earnings um, that they're now making 50% less than other racialized groups, um, and certainly less than the mainstream as defined here as white males. Um, as a community, both specifically the black community, but it's a society as whole, well, we tend to focus um, on, when we talk about black communities, we tend to focus on issues of criminality. We talk about um, the overrepresentation of our children in um, the child welfare system. We talk about the over incarceration of black 
men particularly, but increasingly black women um, in the criminal punishment uh, system. Um, but we don't pay much attention to things like um, earnings or, or how we're doing economically or um, how our entrepreneurs doing in terms of having access um, to, to credit, um, to financial, to how they engage with financial systems, um, for, for example. Um, as I was watching for, you know, I was thinking, well, what, what, is, what does all this mean? And I thought, well, when I looked at how Chinese women, for example, um, continue to do well in the labor market, and I think that has to do with the 10 Chinese women themselves tend to be um, stereotyped in terms of their affinity to sciences and so tend to be streamlined into those areas in our educating um, systems, and which is the area of where, you know, the work is, where the money um, is being made. But what occurred to me is what, what are the implications for immigration policy? Right? We, we hear about the model immigrant all the time. And I think these findings just reinforces um, what we've been talking about anecdotally um, for, for quite a while. Um, I, I, I actually had um, a side note as well, and it's a question for the researchers. I was quite surprised by the category of Latin American. Um, and I thought, well, have you pulled out um, Black Latin Americans? After mm -hmm. all, Brazil, I'm assuming, mm -hmm. is included in Latin America. Brazil has the largest Black population outside of Africa. So are Black Brazilians included in Black people, or are they included in Latin American? Um, you can answer that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so, so that was um, one of the one of the things that I wanted to to talk about. I also thought it would be interesting to know because I think anecdotally we, t we tell ourselves as um, black community um, we we know that you know the early arrivals um, from the Caribbean. Um, we know black Nova Scotians are not doing as well um, seven, eight generations later um, as people from, from the Caribbean, as black people from the Caribbean who are doing less better than um, our more recently arrived continental African um, peoples. And so I think it's about time that we began to disaggregate this category of blackness. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when I'm wondering how different um, the stories will be, I don't think it'll be significantly different, but it will be nuanced that we know, we know how are continental Africans doing compared to um, Caribbean, African Caribbean, um, compared to African um, Canadians, um, especially those who've been, whose families have been here from the 1700s, as an example, 60, late 1600s, um, 1700s. Um, I found it interesting i think um and i, I won't comment I'll, I'll leave that to some of the academics to comment about what happened um in terms of the economic downturn that saw um the earnings of all racial groups um falling so i i, I won't um talk about that too much um but i did want to comment on on the fact that our black youth i think one of the reasons we're seeing our black youth doing even worse um in the more recent um cohort is because I think that they have been raised um, with a consciousness of anti-Black racism, and they're not taking it and, and bearing it, that they're pushing back against it, that they're naming it, that they're calling it out. And what they're finding out is that the system pushes back. Mm -hmm. And so, they, and so they're, get, they're suspended. They are unseen. They have no expectations. Of, of, of achievements. They're told they're not smart enough. They're streamed into sports. They're streamed outside of the sciences. We don't have the kinds of supports that we need in our school system. They're not seeing themselves in front of the classroom. They're not seeing themselves in the content of, of, of what's being taught to them. And so why then are we surprised that there are higher numbers of school dropouts. They're less likely to go to post-secondary education. And even when they get into post-secondary education, the supports are not in place. One of the programs that I really look to um, is the transitional year program that was started at, at D of T and, and it's focused on black and indigenous and more recently indigenous um, youth and the kinds of wraparound supports that it brings. What would happen if we had those supports throughout the undergraduate years of education for our Black and other marginalized youth? Um, where are the mentors? 
that ensures that they have what they need, that they're taught how to navigate through our university systems. Where are the networks that they have so that they're getting the kinds of internships that lead to future employment or encouragement to go on to graduate programs and to graduate schools. And I also think one of the things that, that's missing, um, you, you know, I was talking to um, Dr. Carl James the other day about some of his own um, work and around, very much around, around the work that he's doing around this in terms of um, how, how are Black um, youth, youth doing? Um, and, and, and things are not, you know, while other groups are getting better, things are not getting better um, for us. Um, and I will never forget when he said, the longer Black people are in Canada, the worse off we are. Mm. And that's quite a statement. And this data mm. is bearing that out. And so I'll stop there and we can talk about solutions after. Thank you so much, Debbie. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Firon Gervin. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And it uh, was also really uh, useful reading the report and seeing the analysis and just like to commend the researchers on, on the effort done. Uh, so maybe a uh, first question to, to answer is, um, and did I consider the findings surprising uh, in, the, in that regard? Um, I would actually say I didn't find the findings um, surprising. There've been a, a series of studies uh, going back to the 1990s on taking a look at wage gaps across um, a variety of different groups. And in some senses, some of the, the findings were relatively consistent uh, with that. Um, what I think is um, material about this report is it's effectively saying that some of those findings of the wage gaps that would have been um, caught in data from um, the 1990s, um, early 2000s, um, and in that regard, that that um, impact is now persisting and having a second, third generational um, a multiplier effect um, that's broadening the gap um, in, in that regard. And I think while not surprising uh, is material and um, um, says uh, on address uh, that we will end up with a, a polarized Canada um, with some of the fallouts and some of the implications um, of that. And that then uh, really challenges um, the question for me, not so much about whether the Canadian dream um, is broken or not, um, but what kind of Canada um, would we like to have and what kind of, kind of Canada would we like to see in the future in that regard, um, uh, consistent with some of your forecasts, census forecasts on um, the demographics um, by 2040. Uh, the second uh, item that I'd like to say is that I, I think that there are multiple stories and multiple narratives and um, each of the narratives can um, simultaneously be true uh, in that regard. And we, we don't necessarily have to um, view that one narrative is right and the other narrative is, is wrong. And I'll give um, an alternative narrative for a moment. Um, some years ago, um, uh, uh, University of Canada uh, did a survey of um, not only the student population, but the faculty, staff, um, presidents, and so forth uh, throughout the Canadian university system. So 97 universities in Canada, um, still now in terms of pub publicly funded, 6% uh, of the undergraduates um, were black. 6% uh, of the graduate students were black. Um, the black population at the time made up about three to 3.5 percent of the population. Mm -hmm. Consequently, that narrative says that at universities and colleges, that there's an overrepresentation mm -hmm. relative to the population. Um, and it really challenges the narrative mm -hmm. about black boys, black girls not doing well. However, if you looked at the professors, the deans, the presidents, all of a sudden, that statement radically changed. So at the time, 1% um, of, um, and it was less than 1% of um, the presidents uh, at Canadian universities were Black. Um, that was me. <laughs> right. So I was the first Black Canadian to be the president of a Canadian university, in fact, two Canadian universities and now a college. Um, what I'm getting at, that then says that what was happening was that for those students, Black students at the PhD level and the master's level, it became a disincentive structure for them to continue on to be professors and the likes. Um, the second item in terms of the wage gap then, that also says it's not just a wage gap, it's a lower return on the investment of education. 
And consequently, then that lower rate of return on the investment to education is directly correlated to the kind of findings that you get in that investment in the second generation in education. So again, I don't think if we look at it from an incentive structure, from an investment structure, that you would actually say it's surprising. What is surprising is that notwithstanding the lower rate of return that you see over representation at colleges and university from the black population. Mm -hmm. So I think that narrative of success failure without, I think that we have to be really cautious about that narrative of success failure mm -hmm. as to what's going on. Um, the second one, um, or third one, um, one of your hypotheses um, related to the idea of marginalized con um, communities and concentration of communities. Um, I grew up in Canada and grew up in Toronto. Um, and uh, I can remember uh, back in the late 60s, 70s, yes, I've got great people. Um, <laughs> um, the Black community in Toronto uh, was highly concentrated around Bathurst and Bloor. Um, today, the Black community is dispersed. Um, and I think if you take a look at communities across Canada, what we find um, demographically is an increasing dispersion and an increase in growth in the um, portion of the population uh, that are, are intertwined, intermixed, meaning that Canada of uh, 50 years from now will look like a, a juggling of all the peoples in this room in that we will all be interplayed and interdefined um, into a new Canada. Um, what that then says, um, back to that question about the Canadian dream, um, is that regardless of which definition of a population that's included, excluded, or lagging or not lagging, uh, that then really points to an underperformance of Canada in terms of productivity, prosperity, and possibility. And um, we're looking at this from an internal case of what's happening in Canada. Uh, when you look at it at a global um, context, the fastest growing economy in the world today is Guyana at 38% GDP growth. Um, so what that means then is that the ability for Canada to attract, retain talent and capital um, into its future prosperity will be highly dependent on its ability to address these kinds of questions. And the failure of the society to address these um, issues in, in the sense of seeing it as a dichotomous, it is about the black population or this population, that population, and will become irrelevant in a globally competitive world for both talent um, and capital. Um, lastly, um, what I'd like to be able to say, and, and um, I, I think the Canadian government and um, I don't speak for the Canadian government, uh, so I'm speaking in reflection of the Canadian government. Um, there's been commitment in, in Canada um, under the um, United Nations um, International Decade uh, for People of African Descent. Um, the federal government has just extended its commitment um, because it's, it's a 10 year commitment. The government of Canada started the process in uh, 2018, so a couple of years after. Um, the actual um, um, declaration in that sense. There have been a series of initiatives and, and programs and efforts. And I think in many respects, if we take a look at uh, pay equity, uh, employment equity, and what that did to the gender gap in terms of wages and performance and promotion, um, that um, the statement is correct. Uh, government policy is material. Um, and the policy implications of the paper then uh, is material. Uh, but I would also say that, um, that society is not just made up of formal structures of government. Um, it's made up of institutions like this one um, in uh, TMU. Uh, where researchers can do work like this. It's made up of institutions like um, um, the one for which I'm the president, George Brown College, for which we can have initiatives um, for um, Black student success, um, for Indigenous student success, for inclusion, for um, a sense of well being. And that then says um, if that means if government have an obligation, institutions have an obligation, I think individuals also have an obligation. Yeah. And consequently, the society that we shape as decision makers uh, really matters. So in that sense, um, if we take a look at how we evaluate competency, uh, social capital, support, mentorship, and so forth,
in our own world and in our own, own interaction, I think it's important for us not to um, only ask of our governments, only ask of institutions, but I think also to ask of ourselves, uh, what is that Canadian dream? And for us to ask leaders in general, uh, when they advocate for one position or the next, what is their dream of Canada? Um, uh, personally, uh, I now have children and grandchildren. I was actually born in England uh, in that regard. Um, so guess what? I think we're all here to stay. So if we're all here to stay, I think we better be jointly um, vested in defining the Canada that we will all end up enjoying and um, prospering in the future. So thank you for the opportunity. Thanks so much. Okay, so next I'm gonna to turn to Nicholas uh, who is online. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for um, uh, having me on the panel. And I apologize that, you know, I couldn't make it in person. Uh, otherwise, you know, I would I was looking forward to meet with some of my friends uh, today in person. Um, so in terms of the the findings of the report, you know, I don't, you know, they, they do resonate with me. And I don't know how much my experience growing up uh, and being educated in Hong Kong can translate into um, the, you know, in the Canadian setting. Um, when I finished high school and applied to university, there were about five to six universities in Hong Kong. And certainly, you know, um, now we have 22 degree granting institutions in Hong Kong. I guess the point I'm trying to make is the fact that, you know, you know, I'm not surprised that we are seeing, you know, um, uh, an improvement in terms of the, the education levels for successive second generations because of, I think that speaks to the achievement of universal education. Um, and, but, you know, when I look back, you know, you know, when, when, when we try to talk about the um, earnings, which we define, you know, how, that's how we define success in life, you know, how much money you make, um, I feel, you know, in the older education system, only the cream of the cream could actually um, have the opportunity to go to university. And, and I think, I don't know, you know, are there pros and cons? You know, it's just a thought out there. You know, I, I, you know, I think it's worth thinking, you know, by universal education, do we really um, have, you know, a system that, you know, it's... Sorry, I hate to say that, but, you know, I think there's always a hierarchy, you know, not everyone had the same opportunity, but at the same time, what we are seeing, um, you know, in terms of the outcomes, whether it could be related to the fact that we have developed a universal education system where, you know, it's open to all, whether, you know, you 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 do have, you're, you're cut out for, you know, uh, education in school or you cut out for education in life, right? Um and then, you know, the second thing that, you know, I thought of, you know, about, you know, the, you know, the changes we are seeing, you know, definitely there have been uh, te technological advancement. Uh, I remember, you know, the earlier generation, you know, the, my, 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 my older siblings, um, they actually didn't have TVs, they only had radio, for example. And so I think they, they have more time to develop people skills because that's how you learn right and social through social interaction and I feel like the the next generations like my when I look at my nieces and nephews what I find interesting is you know they they definitely they they have spent more time online and I don't know whether you know when you translate to um your skills in the workplace like I definitely feel the soft skills people skills organizational skills, time management, all these things are crucial for, for me to perform at work. So I don't know whether, you know, those kind of, you know, technological changes, you know, that cut, you know, that, that um, you know, increasingly there's less people to people interaction, whether that would have an impact in, in, in the successive generations of, sorry, successive cohorts of second generations in terms of the way they, behave, they work, you know, in, in, in the work setting, because that's certainly, you know, I feel like, you know, the younger generation of colleagues that I've seen, you know, there's somewhat, you know, different culture, cultural shift as well. So I don't know whether that speaks to um, some of the, the, the changes we've seen in terms of like how that translates to 
work performance or, or, or earnings. Uh, and then, you know, uh, in terms of expectations, I thought, you know, that's also could be a factor, you know, certainly for me, you know, when I came to Canada as an adult, you know, after I've just finished, graduated from university, um, the expectation was different, I think, for the first generation uh, compared to, you know, my nieces and, and nephews who grew up here. I think they have the expectations more higher expectations than I would coming as a first generation. And I think those expectations comes from their confidence uh, that they grew up here. They speak perfect English, no accent. Um, they are fully integrated culturally. Um, and, and I think they feel like they deserve it. They belong to it. So I, I, so I feel, sorry, I'm not very articulate because I, I feel like whenever we, we talk about these issues, like it's, it's hard to articulate. I, I, you know, there's no language to describe it uh, properly, but I, I just feel they feel like they deserve, they deserve being here. So their expectations are set higher and that also could create a disappointment, right? So it, it's somewhat like it speaks to this mental psychological impact uh, of that. Um, and um, the second questions about, you know, why do I think the trends over time happening. Certainly, I think the job market has changed. Uh, technology, automation, all these things actually changed. Uh, you know, there used to be good blue collar jobs and those sort of disappeared into gig jobs. And then um, um, there's definitely, you know, we, we, we've seen, you know, population growth, you know, globally and also here in Canada. This year, we've passed the 41 million uh, population mark. Um, so when you have more bodies, definitely more competition, I, I feel. Um, and then in the, um, um, uh, the um, and also I feel, sorry, my thoughts are sort of all over the place, but another thing, another thoughts I have is in terms of the role that socioeconomic backgrounds, you know, uh, how, you know, upbringing may have an impact on different immigrant groups, different ethnic groups differently. Um, I, I feel, you know, if you come from like a working class background, and as we know, you know, a lot of the uh, first generation uh, immigrants, um, they tend to struggle to find their footing uh, at first. And so when you have both parents, you know, even like in general, the society, you know, you know, back, I was, I would think, you know, before in the, you know, um, uh, in the 60s or 70s, there are more usually, you know, one parent working and then the mom would stay home uh, uh, to look after the kids. And I think, you know, parenting, you know, is such a big thing in my family, like, you know, maybe for a lot of Asian families too, like, you know, that I think parenting is an investment. Um, in, 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 you know, in the long run in, into the society. But when you have, you know, both parents working, they're struggling uh, and there's no proper, you know, daycare. I feel, you know, um, that increasingly, I think could explain to why successive cohorts of second generations, you know, may not be doing as well because, you know, if the you have the, the first generation not doing as well, or maybe, you know, instead of having just one parent working, you now have two parents working. I think that that's bound to have an impact. Plus, you know, uh, if you already, you know, um, you grow up in a disadvantaged background, you know, you definitely uh, uh, already, there's less resources, you know, um, available, you know, you may not have the opportunity to do, to take all this, classes after the after school programs uh karate you know you know piano lessons and i think that created that vicious cycle of you know what we are seeing now you know with you know the successive uh second generations not doing as well uh so i you know i feel like socioeconomic upbringing certainly is a big factor and i look at you know my own career you know as as a journalist too um I came from a working class background and English is my second language. Um, so I felt like when I have to interview, I will always feel intimidated when I have to interview like CEOs or, you know, uh, attend, you know, big banquet, I have to interview 
um, reach people for, for the lack of a better word. I always feel intimidated because, you know, I never had that exposure. I don't have the language to the same language to interview those people. Um, and I didn't feel fit in. And I think that speaks to the lack of exposure, right? Because of our socioeconomic background, um, uh, that would impact your exposure. And then that, that also would have an impact on, you know, your the network that you, you are able to build. Um, and, you know, or, or you know, the, the, and even the lack of, you know, um, role models too, because, you know, when I, you know, attend some of those, you know, events, you know, I just don't see myself represented. And um, when I started, you know, in the 90s, you know, working at Tsingtao Daily, a Chinese language paper, you know, as a reporter, you know, I looked at, you know, on TV, there was like Wei Chen, you know, uh, Ben Chin and Adrian Clarkson, you know, that, you know, when you see those role models, you saw yourself reflected, you know, you started to have expectations, you started to have that dream, you know, of, you know, one day you would make it there as well. So I feel like, you know, having those representations, that diversity is really important and can be inspiring for, for second generations. Um, um, and, and, um, yeah, but, but I just still feel, you know, at the end of the day, you know, there's so much education achievements can help you uh, succeed. And I would think, you know, that your socioeconomic um, upbringing already set the limit um, to a certain extent, how far you can go. Um, and then, uh, sorry, the last um, question, how can we prepare? Um, the Canadian Nicholas, maybe oh, maybe what I'll do. I'm sorry to interrupt. Maybe what I'll do is just so we have enough time for we are going to have a, a bit of time for back and forth. So I think it'll be really great sure. to maybe address that this question of what can we do when we have our back and forth discussion because I think that's a really important question um, that maybe I'll reserve for that part of the discussion. So I'm going to turn it over to Nahid. Um, so go ahead, Nahid. Great. Th thanks so much. Um, thank you all. Uh, for your interest in this, and thank you to the research team for doing this work, which I hope will really kick off a big conversation. Now, um, when I sit on an academic panel like this, I always feel the need to credential myself, so <laughs> um, I will point out to you that I am also an academic, though I'm not sure if I'm still employed by the university <laughs> or not. It'll shock you to know that sometimes universities are very bureaucratic. Um, I've been on a very, very long leave from my university, and I haven't heard from them in a while, so, so I might actually be unemployed. Um, but um, I am an associate professor um, in the Business School of Business at Mount Royal University, and my field is nothing related to this. It's, uh, it's about nonprofit management. But the reason I'm a terrible academic and had to become a politician so that I could be invited to panels like this uh, is because my research was always focused on practical things, uh, which is easier in a business school, but on things we could actually do, which is one of the things that I'm really interested in what these data can help kick off for the conversation that we'll have. So maybe it's helpful for you to know my story. So I, my family is from Tanzania. Um, from a colonial uh, country in which the very clear elements of um, pushing one ethnic group over another, as Dr. Jaffe is telling us, was not hidden. It was extremely explicit. And, um, you know, keep them all down, but keep some down further than others. And that's the context that my family comes from. So my mother uh, discovered she was pregnant just before they immigrated to Canada. So I often say that I was born in Canada, but made in Africa. Uh, and I was born just down the street from here at St. Mike's Hospital. Uh, then uh, I did my research at the age of uh, 14 months, and convinced my parents the future was in the West, and grew up in Calgary and came back here in my 20s. So when I was 23 years old, I remember this very well, it was Christmas time. And I had just had my annual performance review at work. And a friend of mine, a coworker of mine, and I were going to a concert at the Music Hall on Danforth. And we were standing outside of Pizza Pizza, 
eating a slice of pizza before the concert. And she was my coworker. Um, she was a white girl from rural Essex County, Southwestern Ontario. And I looked at her and I said, you know, something strange happened today. And I know we're not supposed to talk about our salaries and our bonuses, but I got a raise today. And I'm now making $60,000. And I looked at her and I said, I'm 23 and I'm making more money than my dad ever made. Mm -hmm. And she looked at me and said, me too. And we had a moment talking, thinking about social mobility. Uh, and then I said, why are we eating pizza from Pizza Pizza on the corner <laughs> if we've suddenly discovered we're really wealthy? <laughs> By the way, the rent for our, which was also my roommate, and the rent for our incredible three-bedroom townhouse on Shaftesbury Avenue near Summerhill Station was an unthinkable $1,800 a month. <laughs> I don't even want to think about what it is now uh, for that place. But nonetheless, that was our conversation about social mobility. Now, even then, even then, and for those of you um, from Asian backgrounds, you probably know this is true. Even then, we would talk about how poverty in immigrant communities in Canada was not an intergenerational problem, but it was a problem of one generation and the kids are gonna be all right. But even then, we would add a bracket except for the black community. We didn't do anything about it. But even then, we talked about it. And what prevented us from actually having the conversation further was, I think, two things. Number one was straight up racism. And number two was the fear of being branded racist mm -hmm. by actually pointing it out. Mm -hmm. And so now more recently, uh, in my community, in my Muslim community, we sort of sneer a little bit at Central Asian Afghan people in Canada and for Syrians who come to Canada and go, why is it taking them so long to achieve the same kinds of educational and income outcomes that we achieve so easily? And for a long time, my argument was, you know, we're forgetting one thing, that with all the evils of the colonialism that we came from, my parents went to British schools. Mm -hmm. They spoke English when they came here, albeit with a quote unquote accent. And I always put quotes around that because, of course, you will all know that the most populous English-speaking country in the world is mm -hmm. India. So the Indian English accent is actually standard English. <laughs> Second most populous English-speaking country in the world, any guesses? It's China. <laughs> then the United States. And so because I strongly believe, and when I speak to immigrant serving agencies like the work you do, I, mm -hmm. I sometimes get myself in trouble. You've probably heard me say this when I talk about how English language acquisition is the single most important thing that we can do to help immigrants uh, integrate into the community. But now that doesn't hold true for Caribbean Black populations and many African Black populations who also speak English, often as their first language. Mm -hmm. So the question then becomes, so what's going on here? And so I'm really pleased that we've got the data. The data leads to lead to tons of questions for me around, you know, the question that we were asking is how do these second generation, um, I say first generation, but it's a definitional issue. Mm -hmm. I say immigrants, then first generation. I think of myself as first generation. But in, the, in these data, we could talk about that as second generation. And I'm in the first cohort. Um, so how do these second generation folks do compared to the mainstream? The other question I'm interested in, how do these second generation folks do compared to their parents? So if we can back up a little bit, with the exception of indigenous communities and some poor rural communities in Canada and black communities in Nova Scotia and particularly in Southern Ontario, issues of poverty in Canada have largely been non-intergenerational issues, which is unlike other countries. They've been issues of one generation. And then the kids go to school, as you say, overrepresented in university, and that washes itself out. And then we start again with the next generation. We're starting to see that's not true anymore. And that those areas where there is intergenerational poverty are starting to spread. And this is something that it's extraordinarily important for us to really start talking about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so there's many questions. How much of this is related to discrimination? 
And so I'm going to tell you anecdotally, I believe some of it is, particularly in Black communities, but I don't think that's the key driver. Mm -hmm. So then we ask ourselves, well, what else is going on? What else is happening here? What do we know about neighborhoods that kids are growing up in? What do we know about familial expectations on them? You know, the joke of how Asian parents are so pushy on their kids for educational attainment, it's true. Mm -hmm. But it's not true because they're mean. <laughs> I have a niece who is the uh, is one of the second largest undergraduate scholarship in Canada and is the top student at a very, very large university. And of course, whenever she comes home with her grades, I say things like 97. <laughs> what happened to the other three? Um, like we say about Kamala Harris, vice president. <laughs> Why not president president? But there's a reason for that. And the reason is that many of these folks have been through what I call the greatest bait and switch system in the world, which is the Canadian immigration system. So people come here having achieved enough points to immigrate. The points come from your educational attainment, your language proficiency, your profession. And then of course they get here and the system is designed. This isn't accidental. The system is designed so that when you arrive here, you're told, well, actually you can't work in your profession. Mm -hmm. You know, we need people in long-term care. We need people in retail. And too, too many of these adults' arrivals come here and give up and basically say, all right, well, I'll work at Tim Hortons. I'll work as a PSW, a personal support worker in long-term care, as long as my kids are okay. So that's where that comes from. Uh, and it works sometimes for the kids, but it also means that one generation completely lose their dreams. And then to your point, Wendell, the real problem is that you have a group of young men, mostly, who've come who are in between. They're not old enough to give up their dreams. They're not young enough to be able to start fresh. What happens to those young men? What kind of lifestyle are they pushed into? And the great example that I'll give you is... When I was young, when I was six or seven years old, the neighborhood that I grew up in changed forever by the arrival of a bunch of people from Vietnam, who we called boat people. Now that particular group is doing great now, but for a long time, we're not doing great. And the issue of gangs and so on in Western Canada was less about black communities and much more about Asian communities, particularly Vietnamese communities. That problem has almost completely disappeared. Part of it is just generational cycles, but part of it, and this is just an interesting factoid for you, is because in Calgary, the young Vietnamese women were the ones who made huge change in the community, simply by saying to the young Vietnamese men, we will not date you if you're engaged in that lifestyle. And it sounds so ridiculous, right? But that societal shift is what allowed those young men to figure out a new way of moving forward. And so these are the kinds of very practical questions I think that we need to ask ourselves when we look at these issues. You know, it's not about saying, well, the Asians can do it. Why can't the Black communities and Latin American communities the, and the Filipino communities be exactly like them? It's not about that. But it is about really asking ourselves questions that we've been too scared to ask around what can we do and can we make a value judgment that says a certain kind of lifestyle is better than another kind of lifestyle? Mm -hmm. And what are the barriers that are preventing people from being able to get that educational achievement from being, a, and you know, this is about income. Income is not the be all and end all, but I think we can all agree that having a decent life, a safe life, a life free of violence is a good thing. And if we can start there and really try to push down on what is preventing that from happening among certain groups without the fear of being branded as racist and having those conversations. To me, this is a critical step towards true anti-racism. It's a critical step towards truly understanding how everybody who grows up in our community can live a life of dignity and a life of potential and a life ultimately of prosperity. And I think that's really our goal here. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all of the panelists. Um, I want to take a few minutes now, very briefly, you know, we've touched a lot on 
um, maybe some of the factors, some of the implications, some of the meanings, some of the historical issues that may have led to this. I think that's really, you know, come across really clearly. What I want to kind of build on is what Nahid just asked. Mm -hmm. What do we do about this? What do we do about this? And of course, we don't have a lot of time. I know we need a lot of time, but we don't have. Uh, but maybe um, I will ask, go in the same order again. And Debbie, just very briefly, what are some practical solutions that might actually help? I don't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> the, older I, the older I get, you know, 10 years ago, I would have spewed up all this stuff. Um, but for those of you who know me, you know that I, I really do believe in um, the role of public policy. Um, I'm not as concerned about, about winning hearts and minds. Um, at that I am is that we put good legislation in place and then we monitor and enforce. Um, and so, and Jeff talked about this um, earlier when he um, was doing his part of the presentation, is that I think we need to reopen the conversation about provincial employment equity legislation um, and to make it mandatory for the private sector. Now, how do we sell this politically is the, is the big question. Uh, right, we had it in the early 1990s with the NDP government. It was the first thing that the incoming Harris government um, got rid of. We've been able to maintain, and as Govan um, reminded us, to actually um, finally, after many years of advocacy from organizations like uh, Mokasi and the Color of Poverty, Color of Change, to now have um, Black people um, and um, lesbian and gay and trans. Um, folk named um, in our National Employment Equity Act. We still need a, a more robust enforcement um, system, but we know from data that is making a difference. It certainly made it a significant uh, difference in terms of um, white women um, in the public service. We're seeing other groups also um, ma making headway in terms of racialized communities. We needed to name Black because Black people, of course, were not um, advancing in the same way from it. But here in Ontario, which has the largest Black and racialized population in the country, we need provincial legislation. And we need the government to be saying that if you want to do business in Ontario, then you need to be um, intentionally hiring people who look like the province, and not only at the front line, but also throughout the organization, and to create some incentives to make that happen. Um, I, don't, I, I think, unfortunately, we are in a political moment where we're seeing real pushback around anything that has to do with employment equity, affirmative action, as they um, call it in the, in the States. Um, I think um, we have seen quite a lot of um, disinformation um, coming from many of our political leaders um, as well. We, we I, I believe that the whole notion of paying attention to um, the historical experiences of various groups and how we did and where we've now landed um, notwithstanding um, what Nahid and, and the other panelists have talked about, um, means that there is a real um, hesitation and a real questioning um, of, of, of particularly Black women um, when we are in positions of power, um, that if somehow we're, it's taken away that we're there because of merit. There seems to be this um, tension that exists between equity and, and merit, right? It's a conversation I argue with the union as well, with unions all the time um, as well. So I think there, and I'm saying all of this because these are all of some of the challenges um, that we face in advancing these kinds of conversation in terms of how do we use public policy to make the real change that we need on the ground so that we are beginning to attempt to level and to support um, groups who are not doing well as well as they should be. Um, I think and we also have to normalize um, it's what Dr. Farron talked about. We need to normalize um, Black accomplishments. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, it's not exceptional that Black people do well. Um, you know, yes, and I, and I like the analogy that if we look at Black people as 3% of the population with 6% um, in post-secondary education, yes, that's a success story. But then the question in the back of my mind, but um, what percentage of Black population are in post -secondary? is the question that then comes up for me, right? As compared to um, other, other groups. And, and, and so how do we um, interrupt that? Um, we, we, I, I think we have to remember that there has been an intentional way of keeping down particular communities. And we need to now figure out how it is that we shift that way as a society. If we are to believe in a Canadian dream, how do we ensure that everyone who is 
resident here in Canada can participate in that dream to the extent that they want to participate in that dream, right? I, I think people have the right to define success for themselves. So I know I don't, I'm not giving you any answers, but these are all thoughts. It's a I'm really great story. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to turn uh, to Gervin. Um, you mentioned the, the idea of um, certain groups, Black population in particular, facing lower returns to education and some of the decisions perhaps they make because of that reality. So again, I'll pose the same question to you. What can we do about this issue? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I kind of segmented uh, my thought into to four areas and one is societal, the next is community, um, the next is family, next is individual. I think at a societal level, um, an interesting perspective is is also to, to have a bit of a historical um, perspective. So um, 600 soldiers fought in the War of 1812 um, uh, and uh, along with 900 um, uh, Indigenous um, um, fighters uh, along um, um, General Brock in defense of Upacanda and so forth. If you then take a look at the um, land that was granted to those individuals that fought in the war, there's a substantial difference as to who got land and who did not get land yeah. um, in that regard. Um, what that means then is that, uh, that we do have to take into consideration the historical dichotomy in terms of starting points in society and concept Consequently, when we look at those starting points, um, um, historical, that to recognize that they also have an impact on where we are today as well. So I think at a societal level, um, being able to acknowledge um, impacts of action uh, then can allow us to um, not define that somehow or another genetically uh, one individual performs versus another individual does not perform in that regard. Um, but individuals are all capable of achieving the wide range of possibilities and so forth. And consequently, then, um, I think it's really important in societies uh, when we see um, systemic dichotomies in terms of outcomes and that we also then take it upon ourselves as having a joint shared obligation to address them as opposed to some people being obligated and other people well, not uh, in that sense. So that's at a societal level, and that then um, relates to what kind of legislation we have, what policies we have, what practices we have, what expectations we have, and how do we measure and report on, on outcomes. Um, an example is if you take a look at um, 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 hate crimes uh, in Canada, uh, hate crimes, uh, the largest uh, the largest number of hate crimes is reported against the Black community in Canada um, in, in that regard. So again, I, I think at a societal level, we do need to acknowledge that, but that's the starting point. Now we have to be in action to do something about that. I think the second one is um, at the community level. Um, I think it's really important to have uh, strong community organizations um, because I think from strong communities, you end up with strong societies. Um, and consequently then um, uh, within the black community, by way of example, within each community, uh, what is the role of community organizations in being able to address um, and to be able to speak to and, and, and refine these, these items. And consequently with a study such as this, I would really, um, uh, encourage uh, the researchers to go out to the different communities um, that's been highlighted um, here to the different organizations, present these findings, and then ask them and encourage them to be part of um, the, the action um, in uh, addressing that. I think we heard uh, a lot about families and so forth, and I think um, family expectations are, 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 are important um, in that sense, but I don't think family expectations are shaped in isolation. Family Family expectations are shaped in terms of the context of community as well as yeah. in terms of society. Mm -hmm. um, I was noting uh, one of your um, the findings in terms of um, single family and so forth. But one of the, the major causes of family breakup is actually financial challenges. Mm -hmm. If you have a wage um, um, dichotomy uh, in that sense, we shouldn't be uh, surprised that you're going to find a correlation between um, a wage gap and family formation, <coughs> family structure. Um, 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 strengthening. So I think that these things, uh, we have to be really careful on, on uh, what are um, causal effects um, versus what are endogenous effects, those things that are um, generated 
in the system as opposed to cause um, a cause of what we're observing. So I think it's really um, from this research, I think um, as, um, as individuals, um, we have to be very, very careful to not have the results uh, end up stigmatizing yeah. uh, individuals and normalizing differences as opposed to being able to say to ourselves, they bring attention to differences, but now call us into action. And I'll uh, maybe um, draw attention to a really contemporary uh, item um, without debating the policy. Um, uh, new policy as it relates to international students. Not debating the policy, okay? So leaving that aside, okay? We'd love to debate the policy. Yes, we do. We'd love to debate the policy, but I understand that this is not the panel at the moment. What I am concerned about though is um, who do we define as an international student? What do they look like? Um, and, um, and in that sense, and what are they the cause of? Um, and what I worry about is that while we're addressing differences, we may simultaneously be defining differences mm -hmm. uh, that will make it more and more difficult for us to define uh, what is a common element, which is um, um, a Canadian meaning a Canadian should not be defined by the differences, but through our commonality in terms of what we quest um, for society in that sense. So I worry about while we're addressing some that we're recreating differences simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And consequently, I, I think it's um, really incumbent on all of us as well as society to be really cautious on how we address problems, but how we don't create problems for future generations as well. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, before we turn to Nicholas and then Nahid, I think uh, I'll turn it over to Wendell to say a couple of words. Thank you. The insights that my colleagues on this panel have shared um, have really humbled me. So thank you all again for just the, the brilliance that you've all brought. If I may share very succinctly, good policy and good public policy necessitates a historical consciousness and, and good history, right? An awareness of the past. We, as a society that purports to be a democracy, we must confront and expose the crimes of the state mm -hmm. against black people in this country especially after the second world war mm -hmm. right these were deliberate crimes of the state and the effect that these policies these crimes criminal policies clandestine secret policies have had on generations of african peoples in this country that is first and foremost. So as a result, we need a truth and reconciliation of sorts regarding state criminality and Black communities. This is so fundamental. Secondly, I'm not sure who is aware of this, but in the 1960s, in the 1970s, through the process of deindustrialization, right, as American cities from Detroit, um, Chicago, Racine, uh, Wisconsin, et cetera, et cetera, Milwaukee, were undergoing um, post-industrialism. One strategy that the U.S. federal government, again, this is very high level, but a strategy deployed to neutralize the effectiveness of Black militancy, Black power, right? And the fact that Black men and women and children were working together to demand equal rights, to demand not only personal security, but material security. So the U.S. federal government started a process by which these various skilled trades that one could access in local public schools, inner city schools, where one can become a plumber, yeah. accredited, electrician, HVAC, et cetera, et cetera. Technical skills that facilitated especially Black men into middle-class jobs or, or black, black girls and young women into uh, middle-class jobs. These technical trades were vanished mm -hmm. from public schools. Yeah. Why? Because it was given black communities an economic foundation, an economic foundation that was in turn reinvested into black power and civil rights. So we must immediately, yes, we need we need our girls and our boys going off to university and, and pursuing STEM and all these other things. And they're capable of it, absolutely. But we need to stem the tide that is the horrendous violence 
of our sons in particular, internalizing self-hatred, colonialism, anti-blackness. They internalize it. They don't unleash it on the world. They unleash it on members of the community, on each other, because they hate themselves. That's what you do when you hate yourself, when you've been taught to hate yourself. And we weren't always like this. This is what happens when you go through a genocidal process of transatlantic slavery. Yeah. So as, as my brother uh, Nahid pointed out, yes, in, in the Vietnamese community, Vietnamese girls and young women can tell their, their cohort mates, their, the young men in the communities, if y'all don't straighten up in a particular way, you're not going to make suitable mates. But that requires a sense of cultural, mm -hmm. linguistic consciousness and pride. We have not a clue what African peoples have endured in this hemisphere. The rot, the hatred that was unleashed on us and that we're still working through, right? And so that is so necessary in terms of repairing the damages that have been inflicted upon us. And so in the process of uh, mitigating some of these challenges in our communities, especially where employment is concerned, we must tackle this issue of skill traits yeah. and provide direct training that will lead to gainful employment, especially for these young men. Otherwise, the prison, the school to prison track to gang banging, et cetera, et cetera, will only get worse. And to make matters worse and more relevant for you all, the days of the past where ghettoization meant that Black communities and impoverished communities just devour themselves in isolation is a thing of the past. When I want, I desire good things for my child and for my nieces and nephews, I desire it for your children because your problems will become mm -hmm. mine and mine will become yours. Mm -hmm. So we need to get to this place of shared prosperity. Yeah. And lastly, and I will stop talking. <laughs> no, this is great. <laughs> there was... There was a, an understanding or a misunderstanding, right? Uh, historically, regarding uh, Black communities and Black families, that certain quote unquote social pathologies, um, and my sister Debbie pointed this out, um, certain social pathologies were basically a lack of merit. Right, that black people just weren't working hard enough, weren't trying hard enough. When we have sisters who are leading in positions of authority, brothers who are leading positions of, of authority, their leadership is always challenged, it is always discredited, it is undermined, et cetera, et cetera. And as a society, we must, each and everyone, whether you're black or non-black, we must confront the levels of anti-black racism that is so pervasive and just foundational in everything within our institutions that are necessary for the thriving of our democracy within our government, within societal spaces, we must confront this idea that a sociologist, the black leading black sociologist in the United States described as the deficits of credibility, that whenever we see black folk, black people in places, we presume that they're only there because of some type of token gesture, as opposed to the fact that they probably leapt through more hoops and overcome way more barriers and surmounted more hurdles than anyone else. And so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. That was really important, practical, practical points. Okay. Yes, we are running out of time, but we're going to make time. So very briefly, Nicholas, I'm going to turn it to you. Again, my yeah, question is, what do we do about this? Very, very succinctly. Yep. I have very little to add to what uh, the other panelists actually have, you know, uh, recommended. And I do feel like, you know, uh, we need to work hard at both the grassroots level and also at the policy level. At the grassroots level, I, I really feel, you know, we need, you know, uh, um, more resources, more support um, uh, for racialized uh, second generations um, to create those opportunities. And in terms of, of the, the policy level, I think, you know, uh, in your early email, you said, you know, how can we prepare the Canadian mainstream to support these efforts and initiatives? You know, I'm not a very, you know, op optimistic person, and I'm not sure whether the support is there. Uh, there's a Chinese saying that, you know, um, there, you know, when there are more monks than kanji available, even the monks would fight, you know, for the available food to fill their stomach. And I guess my point is, you know, when the job market is tight, when the competition is intense, 
Um, unfortunately, you know, we 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 are bound to see more nepotism. Um, we are bound to you know see you know more uh, uh, unfair practices um, to, in order to maintain the status quo. I think that's my worst fear. Um, but how do we, you know, overcome that? I, I think the only uh, way to do it is, you know, as um, uh, Debbie actually mentioned, is, you know, some sort of legislated uh, 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 policies uh, to, to mandate, you know, uh, equal opportunities. And, 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 and I think that's the way to go. Um, or we would not, you know, see any changes and improvements. Yeah, that's all I'm going to say. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for those brief, but really, really important words. Okay, and finally, uh, Nahid. Thank you. So let me start by saying that we are not ready. <laughs> we are about to have a wave of newcomers come to Canada, regardless of who wins the next federal election. Mm -hmm. And we are not ready. Our success in diversity and pluralism in this country has largely been in spite of ourselves. <laughs> And so we have an enormous amount of work we have to do right now, and we have to create the space for the public policy conversations to think about how we're going to work on the integration of newcomers to this country in a different way than we've ever done before. And even saying that word integration has been challenging mm -hmm. in some immigrants uh, serving agencies and communities in the past. We got to get over it yeah, um, right. because we're going to have a huge problem coming forward. So I'll, I'll talk briefly about three things. The first is my bugbear that I talk about all the time, language acquisition. Doesn't help so much in black communities, but in some of those other immigrant communities that are coming in, right now we still require people to go to a classroom in the evening, once or twice a week for a linked class, that's language instruction for newcomers to Canada. Now in Calgary, there's a year waiting list to get into a linked class. We have to think very differently. You know, if you or I wanted to learn Spanish, we wouldn't do it like that. We would have online resources. We would think of different ways to be able to pick up the language. We got to get much better at language acquisition. To me, that's the critical cornerstone of ensuring people's success in the country. So that's number one. Number two, given where I sit, there's a lot of conversation we have to have about neighborhood design. We are thankfully talking about increasing housing supply in a big way right now, which is critical, but not sufficient. So I live in a neighborhood in Calgary, which I call the least diverse neighborhood in Calgary. It's the least diverse neighborhood in Calgary because there's no white people there. I kid you not, when I go for a walk in my neighborhood, if I see white people, I follow them. <laughs> and I wonder what they're doing in my neighborhood. <laughs> it's only partially a joke. But... If a kid comes to my neighborhood that I live in, it is very likely that they will go through public school from K to 12 and never have a white kid in their class. I was talking to an urban planner about this last night and he did not understand why that was a problem. Diversity only works if neighborhoods are diverse. Yeah. And if people of different income levels in particular and different ethnicities all live yeah. in the same neighborhood, because that is where you lead to the role modeling that Wendell and Debbie are talking about, right? It's not just within your own community, but within your own ethnocultural community. You need to see successful people in your neighborhood and kind of go, okay, oh, financially successful people and kind of go, okay, that's an opportunity. So we have to think hard about how we create mixed neighborhoods mixed in ethnicity and mixed in income, and we're not doing it now. And this is actually going to be a problem within the communities. Uh, so number three is, as a good academic, um, the, the dodge always is more research is needed. <laughs> and so what this work really helps us understand is from a macro data level what's going on. Now it's time to do much more ethnographic work and reduce the risk from that work of actually talking to people about what's going on in communities, identifying problems and solving them. So if there are social pathology problems, as you highlight, Wendell, you know, if, if, it, if the myth of the absentee fathers in neighborhoods is true, let's find out if that's true. And if that is true, let's figure out how we use mentorship programs, big brothers, big sisters types of things to help fill those gaps, just as one example. But I think that we need to really look deeply into these individual communities. We haven't talked much about the Filipino Canadian community, which is now the largest immigrant group coming to Canada. And there is a whole issue 
around social structures there with absentee mothers, not absentee fathers. But the mothers are the ones that are here. But then when the kids come, having grown up without a mother for a long time, by the way, there's a wonderful new book called Reuniting with Strangers. The author's name is Bonifanco. You must read it. It tells you, it gives you insight into Filipino Canadians that you haven't heard before. But those sorts of things, I think, are really critical. Um, and then the final thing I will say is uh, I'm very excited because I am a champion on this year's CBC Canada Reads, which is coming up mm. in a couple of weeks. The book I'm championing is called Denison Avenue which is a street in uh, Chinatown here in Toronto, College in uh, Dundas and Spadina, just a few blocks from here. The reason I'm telling you this is, A, I want that book to win, so please read it. <laughs> it is now, uh, her name is Christina Wong, and it is now the number one best-selling Canadian book in Canada. Three weeks in a row, I take full credit. Uh, it is brilliant. The reason I'm telling you this is because it is a story of integration you haven't heard before. It is about a woman who has lived in Toronto since 1958, she is a Torontonian. She's never been up the CN Tower. She's taken the subway once in her life. She's never been to a Leafs game. Her Torontonian existence is an existence in her own neighborhood where people speak her language, where she gets food she likes to eat, where she shops, where she can shop. And now her neighborhood is leaving her. So these questions of integration are not just for young people, but they're questions that talk to people cross-generationally, and that now, I think, is our challenge. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, yes, we are quite late, but we have about 11 minutes for some audience questions. So we won't get to all of your questions, but uh, if anyone has any questions, either for us as researchers, clarifying about the research itself, which maybe we can address bilaterally later, uh, but uh, for the panelists, uh, we're happy to address them. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful uh, discussions and really, really insightful learning so much. Um, uh, uh, but I just want to get back to one specific question about uh, the neighborhood, the design of the neighborhoods, the built environment, because the data actually shows a little bit about uh, how this the, the, the growth of ethnic neighborhoods actually becomes a, a factor leading to these income disparities. And could you elaborate a bit more? Because when, when Nahi, you, you talk about this mixed na neighborhood, not only just mixed incomes, mixed ages, uh, but mixed ethnicity, and how can we achieve that? But what, what does the data tell us about this kind of like the, the uh, impact mm -hmm. on income disparity? Maybe we can take a few questions and then answer them. <clears throat> yeah, um, th well, thank you. Thank you all for wonderful talks and interventions. Um, a couple of questions for the researchers. One is if you can go into qualitative research and try to assess the role of the narratives, the negative and positive kind of self-fulfilling prophecies. And the second question is if you, if you see quantitatively any polarization within those communities that you identified. So um, that would help then understand what are the trajectories of more or less success. Um, and a comment to, to the panelists. Well, I believe in policy, but I believe also in agency. And I believe in individual agency and in community agency. And that is to support what you said, Wendell, about the historical consciousness. And I, as an academic, confess I don't know enough about what you say. I'm just educating myself on the indigenous you know, issues. So, so I think this is very important and, and, and we all have a role to play there. But I, just to say that, that I believe in, in both the girls that tell their men, I am not going to marry you if you get, don't get straightened up or in communities like German and I met uh, before today at an event of a community that I think is kind of an example of what kind of, and, and it fosters not just their own community development, but inter-communal and inter, like very diverse Canadian uh, future. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Isaac from Dream Legacy Foundation. Um, great conversation and, and points mentioned. Um, I wanna focus on the economic solution. Um, and I think in discussing the economic solution in trying to figure out with the data, cause there are a lot of data that are out there, but how does data translate to policies and how does that translate to being deliberate? 
uh, with institutions when they're trying, trying to create those economic um, solutions. Um, and in that economic solution is the lack of representation. Um, I think you could drive economic solution, um, but you can't sustain it without making sure there's representation on the leaders actually driving the solution. Um, we know in Canada over the next couple of decades, there's gonna be multi-billion dollar industries growing in the auto sector, the skill trades, skill um, um, tech and innovation, climate, AI. And if we look across all those industry, there's less than 1% that are representation of the economy of the groups that we're seeing needs change. Yeah. Um, and then when you look at what's happening with immigration, not even the normal immigration, but asylum seekers and, and where they're coming from and, and the discrepancies of how they're being treated compared to other communities, um, we're, we're gonna have a big problem um, in the next five to 10 years. Maybe one more before, maybe one more before we ask our panelists. <laughs> Great, um, thank you for the next panel. I, I'm, my question is really about the political repercussions that you see of the adoption of what he described as myths um, that could, uh, and whether or not they're demobilizing in certain countries, in certain communities. I ask because I've been interviewing mothers of Somali kids who've been killed in North York, and they have no explanation for why their kids are dying, except a conspiracy theory, which may or may not have any validity, but the, whether or not it has validity, it, it has repercussions. They work, they go to a community organization, they don't go to political leaders or recognize electoral leaders. And I wonder how, how one manages the, relation, the resource that community services provide and connect it to political representation, which, and I think we have someone on the panel who might be able to think about that. Okay, I know we have a number of questions online as well, but before we get to the online questions, maybe we can address some of these. So um, a few of the questions were related to the research itself. Um, so I think it was you, Anna, who was asking about um, whether we've had the chance to examine the narratives. Uh, and of course, this being quantitative work using census data, the answer is no, right? And this is where we have a real gap and a real need for more research, as we say. Uh, but I think this, this, the results of our study were shocking enough to us that these need to be followed up with in-depth, nuanced discussions of what is leading to this through narratives. Um, and then in terms of polarization within the data, um, I don't think we, we, because we're looking at population level analysis, we don't get a chance to go into those kinds of uh, questions. But I will ask Feng, who is on the call and who is really our methodologist on this study, if there are any comments he has about uh, whether we're able to see any polarization at all. <laughs> oh. Is this? Oh. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, what was the question again? So the question was, and Anna, you can jump in if I don't paraphrase. Um, were we able to really make any comments on whether within these groups there are any polarization, there's any polarization, um, you know, for example, within the black uh, population, are there any details about which groups are particularly doing well versus doing poorly? Or is that something we can't comment on? My answer would be we probably can't, but any, any insights you have there? We certainly can, but uh, we haven't looked at that uh, very carefully. Yeah, it's what I talked about in terms of being able to disaggregate the data based on African continental Africans versus African Caribbean mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. African Latin Americans versus um, African Canadians, yeah. particularly Nova Scotians or Southwestern um, Black people. Absolutely. Western yeah. Ontario. And that's something yeah, we there, can do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. There, there are some stats can uh, publications look at the like, diversity within the uh, Black population. Uh, those, those like uh, with like more recent uh, data, like twenty twenty one census, but uh, we cannot like for our study, we cannot go very back because in the in the say twenty years ago, the 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 population second general population tends to be small, and if we split into uh, even uh, subgroups, it's become like very difficult to get a reliable estimate. Right. So certainly something that can be done, and uh, I think going forward something that needs to be explored. Okay, I, I'm gonna turn it over to the panel. Um, there were some questions about effects of the ethnic neighborhoods, if anyone wants to comment on that. 
um, economic solutions and how we actually increase representation in a meaningful way and perhaps the political repercussions. Can, can Go I, ahead, Gurvin. Yeah. I'll, I'll try to be really quick, um, uh, make sure the other panelists who are great um, get a chance at some of the questions. Uh, just in terms of community polarization, I think that there was some um, work done by Stas Canada some years ago on um, community concentration. There's a kind of a, a, a metric um, that was um, the, the mass part of me brain says measure theory and Euclidean measure they use to be able to talk about concentration of communities. Um, I think that um, interestingly enough, some of the most concentrated communities are actually some of the richest communities in Canada. So um, um, I think we have to be really cautious in what we mean by concentration of communities and outcomes. So that, that's the first one I'd, I'd want to make. Um, I think the um, second part about communities and, and disaggregating the, the uh, data based on origins and so forth and um, length of history in Canada. Um, there's a part of me that 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 says that yes, you might find something, um, but I'm not quite sure if you take a longitudinal point of view, if you don't, won't get convergence to the mean, meaning that um, race, racism, um, discrimination, institutional structures um, aren't simply barriers, they're forces. So that means that you'll have it over time there may be different populations coming in, but it'll over time converge to the mean um, in that sense. And I think we have to be really cautious then that we don't find a divergence in terms of data static wise, and then assume that longitudinally that that will be the outcome. Mm -hmm. And consequently, then we start finding micro differences and thinking we have a solution, mm -hmm. not recognizing that there's broader societal forces causing these outcomes. And that gets to um, um, agency. Um, I think that there's always agency um, all the way through, but there's also exhaustion. Um, and what we um, can also see is that um, institutions as well as society can become um, exhausted or overwhelmed um, by having to work at these problems generation after generation after generation um, in that sense. And that's a significant caution even in the wake of um, individual or community uh, agency. Mm -hmm. And consequently, I think that back to our legislation, our policies and so on, um, that we can't ignore uh, the role of uh, leadership um, all the way throughout the system. And then by definition, the sensitivity, empathy, and representation of leadership throughout the entire system in that sense. I think over the last number of years, we've made a significant progress in Canada in terms of political representation mm -hmm. um, in that. But so democracy is working in that mm -hmm. regard. Um, how is it working in terms of at the other level, at the boardroom table and so on and so on? Um, that's, uh, I think, yet to be filtered mm -hmm. uh, in that sense. I'll stop there with respect to uh, uh, Any others. other final comments on any of these questions? I know the, the questions and answers always get cut off at the end, unfortunately, because of this wonderful discussion. So I really regret that. But unfortunately, I don't think we can take more questions. Uh, but uh, if there's any other final comments from any of the questions, sure. So uh, regarding the question uh, from the back, um, where economic prosperity is concerned. So yes, it's no surprise or secret to anyone that Canada is one of the most prosperous countries in the world, absolutely. But when we look at certain groups, that economic prosperity clearly, according to this neoliberal doctrine, is not trickling down, right? And so to uh, the question, regarding the question uh, from the back, doubling down on, with respect to Black communities, doubling down on economic change makers who are actually having a meaningful and significant impact, doubling down on economic investments, uh, but economic investments not meant to, basically uh, not meant to cherry pick or, or to serve a particular sort of tokenistic purpose where um, capital then becomes calcified at the top, um, but direct economic investments that will get into the hands of community members. And this is what we're not achieving. And so really quickly to the excellent question and point uh, provocation that you raised uh, regarding uh, Somali uh, boys and young men, right? Of course, when we look at the levels of incarceration, gang violence, et cetera, lack of high school completion, Somali boys and young men, literally in the TDSB alone are probably 60% not graduating from high school. And what type of... And, these are individuals who are being pushed out for various poverty issues, um, lack of um, additional communal supports, et cetera, et cetera, right? What type of future would said individuals have? 
it's not going to be positive, positive, especially when you factor in the racial dynamic, the anti-Blackness dynamic, right? And so there are issues around the types of school and the types of education that these young men are being denied, the lack of economic opportunities that they're being denied. Um, and then certainly the, the types of um, uh, internalized racism and the various uh, ways that then they express these through drill music and, and the turf wars and all these other things that, of course, is manifest as a result of policies meant to uh, destabilize these communities. Maybe I'll just say a quick sentence about the politics of all of this. Um, this is very fraught. And so we as citizens need to figure out how we create the space to have these political conversations. So when someone who looks like me or someone who looks like Wendell or Debbie talks about this stuff, and I'll just tell you very personally, I am always accused of playing the race card. Let me tell you something. Anyone who is a person of color in this country knows that the race card is never part of a winning hand. <laughs> and, but that's used to shut down conversation. Yeah. Even when I use the term white people, people get screw, you know, a little antsy. White people aren't used to being thought of as an ethnic That's group, racist. right? Um, but when white people, politicians, <laughs> start to have this conversation, they're terrified of being branded racist just by having the conversation. And so this stuff is deeply politically fraught. Mm -hmm. When you're a mayor, you cannot, ask Patrick Brown, you <laughs> cannot talk about the creation of ethnically concentrated neighborhoods. It's just, there's no space for it. We have to do it. And if we're going to double, triple, or, or, or magnitude increase the number of immigrants to this country over the next decade, we have to create the political space for that conversation. And to your point, I want to know way more about your conversations with those moms. <laughs> because to your point, what we brand as conspiracy theory, if there's no other explanation, you got to understand that's where people go because there's no other explanation. And so we have to be able to create that political space as citizens. We have to lead our political leaders to these conversations. Uh, they're not going to get there on their own. Agreed. <laughs> Wonderful. So I want to thank all of our panelists and your audience for wonderful questions. Um, I hope you've learned something. I hope you're left with more questions than answers because I know I am. Yeah. Um, and with that, I'm gonna conclude the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you.